Chris, uh, I would like to know if the megalithic of Western Europe are an accident of a design. Please. <laughs> right, well, I'll start with a little bit of history. In 1865, a dramatic engraving of the megalithic monument of Pentra Ifan in southwest Wales appeared in the periodical Archaeologia Cambrensis. It showed a couple on horseback resting under the massive capstone profiled against the distant backdrop of hazy mountains. The artist had carefully emphasized the delicately propped nature of the stone, resting on the pointed, pointed tops of three tapering orthostats that barely seemed capable of supporting its weight. Seven years later, a similar image was reproduced in rude stone monuments in all countries, written by the architect James Ferguson. Ferguson's book provided one of the first general surveys of megalithic monuments, covering not only Western and Northern Europe, but also Asia and the Americas. One of his key objectives was to explain why early societies had chosen to build monuments of megalithic construction using math massive blocks of stone. In that context, his comments on Pentra Ifan were particularly salient and bear directly upon the question of chambers and mounds. For, he observed, and you see the quotation here, men do not raise such masses and poise them on their points for the sake of hiding them again. The mode of architectural expression which these stone men best understood was the power of mass. At Stonehenge, at Avebury, and everywhere as here, they sought to give dignity and expression by using the largest blocks they could transport or raise. And they were right, for in spite of their rudeness, they impress us now. But had they buried them in mounds, they neither would have impressed us nor their contemporaries. These engravings of Pentra Ifan are typical of the large numbers of paintings and drawings of the late 18th and 19th centuries that portrayed Neolithic chambered tombs as megalithic skeletons, devoid of any covering of earth or stones. And these views include these famous paintings by romantic artists such as Johann Christian Dahl, and here's one, and the famous Caspar David Friedrich, uh, and in this uh, evening stroll, um, showing a, a, a rather scholarly or rather somber individual walking by a megalithic tomb, um, painted in around 1837. And in these, many of these uh, depictions, many of these paintings, the power of the stones takes center stage set against a dramatic natural background of stormy sky or brooding twilight. This focus on the stones, however, masks an important issue. How many of these structures were ever intended to be visible in that way? Were not the many chambered tombs, including Dahl and Friedrich's Hünengräber, originally covered by mounds or cairns? In Britain, it was the publication of the first English edition of Warsaw's Primeval Antiquities of Denmark in 1849 that appears to have sparked the debate. Warsaw maintained that in the case of some tombs, the stone chambers erected on the summit of these mounds of earth are formed of a roofing or capstone which rests on several supporting stones laid in a circle. Now, the point I'm trying to emphasize here is he is believing that some of these chambers are erected on the summit of the mounds, and that's why they're visible today. And a similar view was held by the Baron de Bonstetten in his famous Essay sur les Dolmens of 1865. He divided dolmens into two principal categories. Dolmen apparent, or visible dolmens, and dolmen couvert d'un tumulus en terre ou en caillou, dolmens covered by a mound of earth or stones. And Bonstetten argued that dolmen apparent are not megalithic structures that have lost their mounds, 
He held that no process can reasonably, reasonably be envisaged that would have led to the removal of those mounds if originally they had existed. So he's arguing that in most cases where you get a dolmen without a mound, that's the way it was originally built. In France, this interpretation was opposed by authors such as Louis Gall and Alfred Fouquet, Louis Gall in 1853, maintaining that all the dolmens of the Morbihan originally were covered by mounds. And uh, Alfred Fouquet in uh, the same year, uh, also maintaining uh, something similar, but in fact distinguishing between uh, mounds in the uh, interior, which were, um, let me get this the right way around. Uh, Gal believed that all these structures, all these megalithic structures, had originally be been covered by mounds, whereas Fouquet argued that only those of the interior of Morbihan had originally been covered by mounds, and those of the coast had been freestanding. And this debate went on. In France, it was largely settled by 1899, uh, when Cartayac was writing as if the debate were settled, affirming that these monuments were originally furnished with a covering of pebbles, stones, or earth, and buried beneath a mound of greater or lesser height. He contrasted this original design with the condition to which many megalithic chambered tombs had ultimately been reduced. Over time, he said, the monument has become degraded and the covering has disappeared. The blocks have been exposed and the chamber, which has been emptied, is itself often ruinous. So that's the debate in France. In Britain, too, advocates of universal covering mounds eventually won out. Uh, William Collings Lucas, one of the famous Lucas family, for example, took particular exception to Vossar's argument, uh, concluding that all cromlechs of whatever form were originally enclosed in mounds of earth or stone. And he went on to say, there is no such thing as a cromlech per se, that these apparent uh, exposed uh, chambers were all originally covered by, by mounds, by uh, tumuli or cairns of some sort. By the early 20th century, the arguments advanced by Lucas and others had won general acceptance. Thus, in the last edition of this famous book, Prehistoric Times, by John Lubbock, he observed that we may regard a perfect megalithic interment as having consisted of a stone chamber communicating with the outside by a passage covered with a mound of earth, surrounded and supported at the circumference by a circle of stones, and in some cases, surmounted by a stone pillar or menhir. So he's presenting this as the normative uh, nature of a megalithic tomb. So by this time, uh, then, this idea of the normal megalithic tomb had become established. And it really remained so uh, through the middle decades of the 20th century. So um, Gordon Child, in the last edition of The Dawn of Civilization, this is 1957 now, said, built chamber tombs, when not erected in an artificial excavation, were probably always put underground artificially by burial in a mound or cairn. Within subsequent decades, however, such a standardized view of the classic chambered tomb has come increasingly to be questioned. And the basis for this reevaluation is twofold. First, we have greater emphasis in recent studies on the uniqueness and the diversity of individual monuments. And secondly, new excavations have led to a greater awareness that many of these monuments are multi-phase in character, most of them perhaps multi-phase in character. And we've heard many examples of that uh, in the course of the papers today. These monuments then, these structures, reached their final form only through successive stages of addition and modification. So it's really a combination of theory and field observation that has reopened the question of chambered tombs and their mounds. Uh, but we can look at it this way. There are really two questions in all this. First of all, were all megalithic tombs covered by mounds? And secondly, there's another more interesting point, really. Was there a single architectural concept that was carried through to completion by the construction of the chamber and the addition of the mound?
I mean, were they always setting out to construct a burial chamber with a chamber covered by a mound, uh, and only when it was complete, for example, would they have thought of burying people within this chamber? Is that really what we're talking about? Now, to address this, I'll cover some sites in, in Britain and Ireland. And first of all, I want to go back to the well-rehearsed example of Pentra Ifan. This is the megalithic chamber that we saw in the first engraving. And this is uh, a chamber that was at the heart of those 19th century debates that I was describing. Now, James Ferguson, in 1872, had remarked the complete absence of side walls. In his view, this site in such a remote location, it was unlikely in this kind of remote location that local farmers had removed the cairn to take materials for buildings off of field walls. He thought it was unlikely that the cairn had been robbed away by local farmers. However, that argument, Ferguson's argument, was dismissed by one contemporary as unqualified nonsense. But even so, it wasn't really until the 1930s that unequivocal evidence for an enclosing cairn, or at least a platform, was discovered. And this is the excavations undertaken by Grimes back in 1936-37, which revealed the outline, at least of the base, of an elongated structure extending back over 30 meters from the chamber. And you can see it here. So there is the chamber. There is this facade, this, this concave facade. And here is the outline of the cairn, which Grimes discovered in 1936 to 37. Um, a number of interpretations have been nonetheless proposed. It's not a simple story here. One suggestion, one suggestion would have it that this is what we should imagine there to have been, that the cairn rose right to the, not quite to the uh, upper surface of the capstone, but at least to its lower edge, so that the, the very impressive capstone, remember, Ferguson argued that why make such an impressive capstone if we're simply going to hide it straight away? So this uh, reconstruction attempts to compromise a little by suggesting that the capstone would still have been visible. Uh, there are also other suggestions. Was the mound much lower than that and just a platform around the base of the chamber? Were the chamber and forecourt originally freestanding and the mound added later? Um, or indeed, did it cover the capstone altogether? There are all sorts of possible interpretations here. Uh, it's very difficult to know which of them is correct. One interesting uh, piece of um, observation, really, that goes back to the 1970s and has been remarked upon again more recently is that, in this case, the, the big capstone appears to have been dug out of a pit on the site. And so, in fact, the construction of this monument consisted of digging a natural boulder out and propping it on those stones. And Alistair Whittle has argued that the purpose of the monument may indeed have been to elevate and to venerate this block. OK, well, the absence of an original covering mound, the argument we've just been rehearsing, has been argued for a number of sites, a number of other sites in Britain and Ireland. And in Ireland, the Carrowmore tombs are a case in point. These survive as small megalithic chambers surrounded by circular boulder curbs. There's little evidence that the space between curb and chamber was ever occupied by a substantial cairn. And this argument is particularly clear in the case of uh, excavated examples such as Caramore 27. So this is a quote from uh, Jörn Burenhult uh, saying that he thinks in this case uh, one is forced to conclude that there was never a covering cairn. Here you have the chamber, here is the boulder curb. And that may indeed apply to other tombs as well. So when you find a tomb such as Pulnebron in uh, the eroded cast landscape of the Burren, there are traces of a surrounding cairn. That's what you can see here at the base. But whether these ever rose to cover the capstone or were merely low platforms, just as we've suggested for Pentra Ifan, remains open to question. And then there are other examples. There are uh, this class of Irish tombs called wedge tombs, where Billy O'Brien has suggested again, has challenged this idea that we must believe that they were covered by mounds of earth or turf or stones. Um, and he says, as, as you see here, some wedge tombs in Ireland are covered by mounds. However, many have no trace of a covering mound, including the majority of those in one region of Ireland, of Munster. 
And uh, the absence of a covering mound, going right back to this 19th century debate, is often explained in terms of natural erosion or deliberate robbing. However, there is genuine doubt as to whether many of these sites were ever covered. Now, in many of the cases I've just listed, there is doubt rather than certainty. The degree to which an original mound or cairn may have been destroyed by human or natural processes is difficult to determine. What's beyond question, however, is that many chambered tombs will have passed through a freestanding phase before the mound or cairn was added. So this is a question of deconstructing the constructional process. How long that freestanding phase persisted and what other activities may have occurred during it deserve more careful consideration than they have hitherto received. And one, one option, indeed, is that in some cases, covering mounds were added as acts of closure after burial activity had ceased. And of course, there are cases, as uh, at Il Khan, where the, the final mound does, in fact, close off all access to the chambers. However, I wouldn't want to get this argument uh, taken too far, because, uh, OK, uh, so clearly, in some cases, such as this is Il Long and uh, many other these examples which have corbel vaulted um, uh, coverings, it's difficult to see how they could have been built to be structurally sound without the cairn being built simultaneously with the chamber. So I'm not trying to come over with some new general view, not at all. What I'm just saying is we need to observe more carefully. And indeed, in other cases, we can show, so here we have good evidence that mound and cairn, uh, sorry, that chamber and cairn are simultaneous in construction. In other cases, we can show the opposite. One such is a megalithic tomb known as the Mound of the Hostages at Tara in Ireland. And there you see it. Uh, these are later probably Iron Age structures and, and this likewise. But this is the small passage tomb known as the Mound of the Hostages. Here, um, the passage grave is covered by a two-tier structure. So there is the passage grave here, passage tomb, and there is an inner cairn of stone marked with this solid line, and then there is a less well-defined outer covering of earth over the top. The chamber remained accessible and continued to receive new inhumations into the early Bronze Age, at which time individual burials were also inserted into the earthen mound. So burial activity inside the chamber and in the mound covering it went on into the Bronze Age. And in fact, I would argue that it's likely that the earthen mound was only added in the Bronze Age. Uh, what's interesting, however, going back to uh, the Neolithic for a minute, um, against the outer face of the orthostats at Mound of the Hostages are three slab-built kists. There's that one there, and a second, and a third. And um, just to give you an idea of what these look like, that's an example of one. So these are against the outer faces of the orthostats. Uh, these kists con contained cremated human remains that must have been deposited before the erection of the chamber. Sorry, let me start again. These contain cremated human remains that must have been deposited after the erection of the chamber. Clearly, the chamber comes first, the kists are built against it, the deposited uh, cremated remains are put in position. But that must have been done before the cairn was added. So you have funerary activity happening in these kists at the, at the period before the Zeni Mound. So it's a freestanding chamber with funerary deposits in these kists around its, its perimeter. And radiocarbon dates and pottery suggest that funerary activity inside the chamber was happening at the same time. So what you have here is very good grounds for believing that at a freestanding early stage, this was receiving burials before anybody thought of adding a mound. So it implies then that, cha that the chamber at Mound of the Hostages was receiving uh, human burials as a freestanding structure for an indeterminate but possibly extended period before the cairn was added. And uh, I think this gives you my rather hazardous sequence. There is some pre-chamber activity as well at, at Tara, which may be the earliest activity, funerary activity on the site. Uh, the construction of the chamber and the kists comes second, probably. Uh, then you have uh, the cremated deposits being placed in the kists and the chamber, and only after that do you get the mound being added. And then finally, in that uh, covering earthen mound, you get early Bronze Age burials. <laughs> 
And the pattern suggested for Tara may have been relatively common. It may apply, for example, to Cotswold Seven tombs of southwestern Britain. Excavations at the site of Belus Nap in around 1930 revealed that the stone-built cairn had had a covering of overlapping slabs laid like roof tiles, and the ridged configuration may be envisaged. So here are the fallen slabs which are thought to have been roof tiles, and this is what it may have looked like. And uh, indeed, most, if not all, of these Cotswold Seven tombs may have been finished with a roof-like structure with a central ridge and sloping sides. Now, it's clear, nonetheless, that the construction of the chambers preceded the building of the cairn. And this is a sequence which Alastair Whittle has suggested for Ascot and the Witchwood. And in the first phase, you have the freestanding megalithic chambers before anything else is done. And it is thought that uh, it is possible, or in fact, in fact, perhaps probable, that they were receiving human remains at the very earliest stage, just after they'd been built, and again, before any mound or cairn was added. So interment in a freestanding megalithic chamber could have been much more common than we often believe even though in most cases those chambers were subsequently covered by a mound or cairn. The decoupling of chamber and cairn suggested by the evidence of these British and Irish examples is more than a mere constructional detail because it goes to the very heart of what we consider a megalithic tomb to be. And examples extend to other areas of Europe, in Scandinavia, which uh, I think Jörn Westphal will be talking about tomorrow, uh, Oscar Montelius recognized a, a category which he called freestanding dolmens, or freistehende dolmen, in his seminal work, De Orient und Europa, of 1899. And in support of this argument, he cites the chambered tomb of Herestrup, where Bronze Age ship carvings on the capstone are argued to furnish evidence that the chamber was freestanding until a mound was added, probably during the Bronze Age. So these are the ship carvings you can see here. So uh, Montelius argued that the, if there had been an early mound, it could only have come up to this height, and any uh, mound covering this capstone must post-date the carvings on that capstone. And there are a number of excavated examples in South Scandinavia that appear to have been freestanding to support that kind of idea and to have been freestanding before the mound was added, uh, one such being perhaps Terup in East Jutland. Here there is a small closed megalithic chamber, you see in the middle here, with a boulder curb around eight metres across. Um, it's quite similar in overall concept to Caramore, which we saw earlier. But what's interesting here is that a sequence of mounds was then added, extending into the Bronze Age. So the sequence appears to be, we have that early structure, then we have uh, a low mound, then we have a cairn, and then we have a much bigger mound, and then we have a huge mound covering the whole thing with Bronze Age burials within it and, it's, and an encircling ditch. There's one further important observation to consider. For most of the monuments discussed above, the presence of a cairn or mound did not in itself obstruct access to the funerary space. In other cases, however, the addition of the cairn was a definitive act of closure, preventing any further funerary deposition within the cist or chamber. So uh, in some cases, the cairn may actually be not part of the, uh, the, the monument in the period when it was receiving burials, but may have been added uh, only at the very end of the sequence to, to close the whole sequence off. And of course, equally, we can, we can uh, uh, suggest, uh, speculate, that the provision of a cairn or mound may not always have been part of the original design. And the whole process may have marked the memorialization of a previous burial space, not one that was still actively receiving new deposits. So, just to conclude then, studies of megalithic tombs frequently consider the burial chamber and its covering mound or cairn to be the product of a, sing a single unified design. Now, we may not believe that here, but it is often still implicit in much that is written and said. Uh, this is challenged by evidence from recent excavations demonstrating that many, if not most, of these monuments were multi-phase construction, 
the result of successive modifications and additions. There is hence an inherent tension between the tomb as finished product and the multiple stages by which that product was achieved. To regard these structures as the intended culmination of a constructional sequence fails to account adequately for the dynamic character of their creation. Since the 19th century, the contention that all such tombs were once covered by mounds has been opposed by the view that some had been built as freestanding monuments. For certain categories of tombs, simultaneous construction of chamber and cairn would have been essential for their structural integrity. The remainder, however, would inevitably have passed through an initial mound-free stage. You'd build the chamber first, and that would be standing for an indefinite amount of time, um, until you then added the mound. And some of them may have been in use. They may not have waited for the mounds to be added before they were used for burial deposition. The addition of the mound, um, rather than marking a structure as ready for use, might sometimes indeed have been essentially an act of closure. At a number of sites, funerary activity can be shown to have begun before the chamber itself was erected, and in these cases, the erection of the megalithic chamber may mark only the formalization of pre-existing mortuary activity at that location. So we have a whole series of dynamic changes, possibly starting before any monument is built, with funerary activity on the spot, then you get a chamber, and then you get the gradual elaboration uh, reworking of the chamber, addition of a cairn, mound, and so on and so forth. So this analysis underlines the importance of disentangling construction, funerary activity, and final form as separate, if interwoven, elements, rather than parts of a single project design that was present from the outset. Thank you.